sort of the sad truth about the fashion industry in aggregate, it's the second largest polluter in the world. And if you start isolating... I had no idea. Oh, it's right behind yeah. big oil. Uh-huh. It is, I mean, from the dyes to the labors, to the materials, to the fact that if you, most items take 60 to 100 years in a landfill before they start yeah. breaking down. Um, and for fast fashion, 60% ends up in a landfill. And so, you know, wow. you start thinking about billions yeah. of dollars and, yeah. and ton, tonnage is going in, trillions of tons. So it's, it's a big deal. Um, then you start thinking about our role in that, recirculating goods automatically keeps and they have to be well made to recirculate and they have to actually have an aftermarket sale because you can't do it for free unless you want to hand out your goods to your friends but if you if you buy beautiful things even if you buy resale you can most likely keep those goods recirculating in the market and it's just really good for the planet one of the lessons i've learned in martial arts is that standing still is asking to be hit. If you stand still in business, your competition is gonna catch up. I start each morning practicing martial arts because it brings me balance and focus. And I wanna know how others stay motivated as well. So join me for conversations on business, innovation, and entrepreneurship. I'm Dan Schulman. Welcome to Never Stand Still. Hi, I'm Dan Schulman, and I'm here with Julie Wainwright, and I'm so excited to have you here uh, with us. Um, Many of you may already know a lot about Julie's career, but uh, she started off uh, a while ago, first out of Clorox, and then, as best I could tell, counting the different uh, jobs you've had, at least four CEO jobs. Right. Your first one starting at age 30. Um, the one that you're in right now, CEO of The Real Real, uh, is one of the huge e-commerce uh, hits right now, growing uh, so quickly. Um, and I really want to talk about that story. Um, but you have so many stories that are perfect uh, for this show, which is Never Stand Still, which is all about kind of what lessons have we learned in our career And you and I have been at this uh, for quite some time. Um, You started off your first CEO job at 30. I was, uh, I think I was 39 or 40 when I had my first CEO job. And there's so many lessons that we've learned along the way. And I was wondering if I could start maybe at, at a higher level and then we'll drill down into some of this. But as you look back at your career, Julie, the ups and the downs of it, what are the big leadership lessons, the uh, meta lessons that you've learned uh, through that time? You know, it's um, it's one of those things where I always find myself, I have to keep relearning sometimes yeah. the same lessons. It really is all about the people and giving them the right authority and accountability and responsibility. So to make mistakes and let them make mistakes and recognizing their skill set. Is it a match to where the company is? Or in fact, is there a mismatch and then moving quickly? But um, it's, and that's a hard thing. So yeah. let's, let's assume that you're in a fast growth company and someone was really, really good for their first year. And then they fall and they fall and they fall. And the truth is they aren't adapting or they don't like growth or they can't handle growth um, or, you know, the company's too demanding. Yeah. And so then you have this talented individual, and what do you do with them? Do you keep them in? Do you coach them? Do you move them sideways? Or do you cut and get them and let them go into a world that's more comfortable for them? So I would say companies are just people and always keeping them front and center and mm-hmm. matching their skill sets to the company's needs is the key. It's the paramount lesson always. And then the other thing is, I you know, just having honesty and authenticity in the workplace helps quite a bit. Yeah. Um, and having that as a tone, um, I've always been that way, but it's gotten easier as I've gotten older because you lose a lot of artifice anyway. Right, and right. Um, keeping that front and center is awesome. For It's awesome for everyone, and you cannot believe your own press. Yeah. You know, once you start doing that or the company does, you fail. Yeah. 
oppress Good and or turn bad. on you one Good way or, or another. Exactly. Right, it's right. a two-edged sword I've found. I also have found uh, in my career that, um, to your point, startups are much different than established companies. And maybe it's because of that life cycle um, that you go through. When I uh, was running Virgin Mobile, on that, a lot like what you did as one of the uh, original like 10 or 15 people there. And I found as we grew from 10 or 15 people, we all fit into a conference room to a couple of hundred to thousands of people. And, and then we grew to be, uh, you know, from 10 million to eventually a billion uh, dollars or so of sales. I actually had to do a lot of replacement of my management team um, as we went into different phases. Do you think that running a startup has its own set of unique challenges as a CEO? Have you found that? Oh, you know, uh, the Real Real is my first real startup. Yeah. And um, first of all, I had a whole new empathy for founders. And then <laughs> secondarily, yeah. um, you know, uh, I mean, the beauty of running a startup is you get instant feedback on what you're doing. Um, if you're strategic and you're fast moving, you're scrappy, you can make a lot of things happen. The downside is you can't always attract the talent you need to help scale the company because people don't want to take the risks and right. you can't afford them anyway. So you've got to figure out balance uh, talent and your money and your expenses. So I would say... Um, I learned quite a bit. I love the um, feeling that it was you're really on the line in a startup, yep. especially when it's your startup. And if you fail, you're like, okay, I'm going to fail hard. Yeah. Um, and if you win, you feel great about that too. But it's more scrappy. The talent required is more get it done. Um, even getting things done is more important than getting them right. You want yep. people to be more right than wrong, but if they spend too much time being like 80% right, you're going to fail. So hiring people with that mentality that actually are thoughtful but recognize that moving fast wins and yep. slowing down or overthinking is death. Yeah. So when you were thinking of starting The Real Real, you had just come out of – uh, the pets.com experience, and you are now kind of thinking about like, what's this next chapter of your life uh, going to be? Can you um, tell our audience or, and, and talk to me about like, what were some of the feelings that you were having as you were starting to think about, okay, I've just gone through this. I now want to think about the rest of my life. I want to start to think about what I'm going to do in this next chapter. What were some of those thoughts like? What, what were you struggling with? What were you excited about? So it really was quite, it was almost 10 years after yeah. Pets when I did this. And I, I realized it's, it's a long yeah. time. And yeah. I had done other things in between, nothing that was captivating. Right nothing that interesting. And I felt like I am getting really bad jobs offered to me that I have no interest in doing. And then I had to do a check, well, how much energy do I still have for the industry, for what I'm doing? Do I love yeah. it? Do I hate it? Can I overcome objections if I go out and raise money? And decided, no, I, this is, I love, I've been in this industry. I've been in tech and software and applied technologies for a long time since uh, yeah. I think I joined in 84, 85. And I loved it. And I had a lot more in me. So then I had to figure out what I really wanted to do because that was my moment where I realized I'm not going to be offered the job I want. So I had to, to create it, which yeah. put more ownership on me to take hold of my future. Um, and I also realized I couldn't work for anyone. I mean, not only, I'm not sure anyone would have hired me, but I knew I couldn't work for anyone. Right. I was basically <laughs> unemployable at that stage because, um, you know, I was, I, I knew too much. I didn't put up with much. And I also didn't, I wanted to create an environment that offered an opportunity for more diversification and uh, really, it was more diversification. Mm -hmm. So as a woman in business, I always face special challenges. And I very seldom, except with Pets.com, and we know what happened with that, yeah. did I have – I was usually turning around businesses and – You were the hired and, gun, really. I was the hired gun, yeah. not creating the culture. Yeah. Um, and I wanted a different culture. Yeah. Let's talk about some of those challenges because I have a very close friend who runs a crowdfunding 
uh, site uh, for women entrepreneurs uh, because women have such a hard time getting funding. It's something like 2% of all venture funding go to women founders. Um, and, you know, if you go to women of color, it's, I mean, it's maybe like just. Yes, you can probably count them on one hand. Exactly. Right. Um, so what was that like when you first went out? You decided, okay, I've got this idea. You obviously think it's a great idea. You've seen it. You've thought about it. You've researched it. And now you're going out to start that. What were some of those initial challenges like? Oh, gosh. Well, there's so many. But, you know, I raise money for almost every company I was in. Yep. And when I go back to when I was really young, raising money for Berkeley Systems, I would go out and I was with my CFO was a man. And they would ask him a question, but it was, and I would answer it, but they would never look at me. I'm like, oh, this is great. This is going to be yeah. fun. Um, <laughs> and we got a little better uh, with pets.com, but then after pets. So when you, when I started to fund the real, real, yeah. I had two things against me, probably three. Um, but I would say my age was was a more of an impediment than my gender, but my gender was a very close second. Mm -hmm. And then I had Pets.com, even though it was a long time ago, still looming large. Yep, of course. So I assumed all those things would be against me. So for the first year, I didn't raise venture capital funding. I raised friends and family. And, um, and I was severely undercapitalized. Yep. But I did that to prove out the business model, so I knew I had a real business model that I could scale. But then the next phase to get Series A was harder than I thought until I started meeting with female venture capitalists because my, my so model is different yep. enough. We're not a pure play platform. Um, we do take possession of goods. We authenticate. We yep. make sure the items are in good condition. We are a service organization. We'll come to your house. We'll help you clean out your home to consign, and then we do all the work. It was the anti-eBay model yep. for a very good reason. Yep. I didn't want to replicate eBay, and I felt like it was a huge opportunity for luxury goods. So I saw this gap. I knew I had to have different levels of tactics to service that gap, and I knew the gap was a multi-billion dollar opportunity. Getting men to buy into that was really hard because, and you know, and I don't actually think this is necessarily a gender thing, but the truth is when you do a series A, you're selling a dream. Even then I had yep. 10 million. You're still selling what's yep. possible. No one's going to invest in a company that- 10 million in, in revenues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had 10 million when I raised my first round, but no one's going to invest in a $10 million opportunity. They want to believe in a multi-billion dollar opportunity. Absolutely. And- then you really have to go be willing to take that journey. And if you don't have any resonance with the product or the person telling the story, chances are you're not going to take that journey because it's a high-risk scenario, yeah. which um, comes down to as soon as I saw a female VC, not only did they understand what I was trying to do, they liked the category. They thought it would be a really mm -hmm. cool thing to have in the market. So they understood it immediately. And the men... Um, except one European male who actually was a connoisseur of luxury goods. Right. He understood it. And then women VCs, no one else understood it. And, you know, unfortunately, when they don't understand things, they can either be nice and be helpful <laughs> or demeaning. And I would say I had, you know, 50-50. 50-50 were like, you know, not, were really jerks. And 50-50 were trying to be nice and tell me why I was wrong. Got it. But I wasn't. <laughs> and you kept, but so, you kept going and going on that. Course. That was a long journey, right? It you, was, yeah. sure. How I mean, long did it take? Well, the first one, I think probably I met with about 50 or 60 wow. potential investors. Wow. And um, and then once I got my lead, they all fell in. So it right. was good. Right. Um, but it didn't get e easier at Series B. And I think the statistics are pretty much the same for women again. And all, I mean, it's really hard for Series A to go to Series B anyway. Yeah. But by that time, we were 50 million. So we went from 10 million to 50 in a year. Um, and so I went through the same process. It didn't really get easy till we were about a half a billion because people kept saying, oh, I don't know. Is there right. really, can this be a multi-billion dollar operation? Right. Now clearly it can be. Well, we're going to be right. over a billion soon. Yeah. And soon for me is within like 18 months, clearly. Right. That's so great. that's great. With a incredible growth rate, right? Good growth, healthy growth rate. We yeah. like healthy growth yeah. rates. Yes. Yeah. 
and a billion dollar business. So as you see the uh, e-commerce uh, industry, there's it's interesting how commerce in general is shifting Boy, right now. Isn't it? Right? It's so it's being redefined by the mobile phone. There's a blurring between online and offline right now. You're seeing so many uh, offline players like trying to move into online, you know, making sure they have that. But interestingly, now you're seeing e-commerce companies moving into offline as well. I think you're experimenting with some of that we as have well, two right? Stores. Yeah. How are you finding that's working for well, you? Well, it's sort of remarkable. I, I mean, we had low expectations. Yeah. Um, here's the cool thing. When you start online, having a technology that gives you pure play omni-channel is great. So we actually have amazing technology in the stores, but that's sort of what runs everything. Beyond that, when people walk in, they understand the brand mm -hmm. and they understand why we're different than maybe their local consignment store right. or what they saw online. And I would say the the, the light bulb that goes on, uh, the understanding of the variety of products we have, and then also a lot of people want to consign in the store. They don't want us coming to their house. So everything sort of snowballed into um, a very big business in New York, and we're only nine months old. Yeah. We opened LA about four weeks ago, and that's off to a great start. So this is this Amazing. is this is becoming a way for us to amplify the brand, get in high quality consignment. Um, but the cool thing is, because of our technology, if you wherever you consign. Yeah. We we know exactly how to service you and what you like. Wherever you buy, we can track you, which also changed the way we account. So we don't look at what happens in the store. We look at the incremental value that store brings. Interesting. And so it's a different way of thinking yeah. about the footprint of a store. Yeah. I was, uh, when I was uh, preparing for uh, for our talk, I spoke to a number of friends, first of all, to see if they had heard of The Real Real, and almost all of them had. And a bunch of them had shopped with it. And it was interesting to hear their comments. So one of the comments um, was, this was a really interesting comment to me, which was like, if somebody else has bought it, thought about buying it, mm. and worn it and taken care of it, that is like a recommendation to me to go and do it, which I had never thought about, you know, in terms of like somebody else's curation would actually matter. And then the other uh, thing that I heard a lot was this idea of sustainability mm -hmm. of, you know, not just buying something and throwing it out, but th this ability to have sustainability. Is that a big part of the brand? Is it something you believe in? How do, how do you think about that? Well, it's a two-part question, really, when yeah. I think about it, because if we didn't have beautiful things, no one would care about sustainability. Right. True. Yeah. But the um, sort of the sad truth about the fashion industry in aggregate, it's the second largest polluter in the world. And if you start isolating... I had no idea. Oh, it's right behind yeah. big oil. Uh -huh. It is, I mean, from the dyes to the labors, to the materials, to the fact that if you, most items take 60 to 100 years in a landfill before they start yeah. breaking down. Um, and for fast fashion, 60% ends up in a landfill. And so, you know, wow. you start thinking about billions yeah. of dollars and, yeah. and ton, tonnage is going in, trillions of tons. So it's, it's a big deal. Um, then you start thinking about our role in that. Recirculating goods automatically keeps, and they have to be well made to yeah. recirculate. Course, yeah. And they have to actually have an aftermarket sale because you can't do it for free unless you want to hand out your goods to your friends. But if you, yeah. if you buy beautiful things, even if you buy resale, you can most likely keep those goods recirculating in the market, and it's just really good for the planet. And I would say that's a new way of thinking that um, most people didn't think about before, yeah. but now the light bulb's gone on. And certainly the younger generation, for me, that's a millennial, yeah. not just a Gen <laughs> Z, but the yeah. younger generation really does understand that, and they are conscious. And then I would also say when you're buying a beautiful thing, that's been designed by an artist, and you even if it's, you know, been previously owned, you, it's still new to you, and if it's in great condition, it's still beautiful. Yeah. So keeping those goods in circulation is, it seems like they should be because they were well made to begin with, and thoughtfully made, and then 
you know, they're relevant and they're good for the planet. So I didn't build it for sustainability, right. but I recognized it early on. I also recognized that if this was a really ugly mug, no one's going to buy it because it's sustainable. But right. because it has a motivational saying, you know, you could right. recycle this. Maybe. I was yeah, thinking maybe. about doing e-commerce around this. But, uh, <laughs> I'll have to think about it. Um, I read in a uh, in an interview that you did that as you were researching um, the real world, you went into your closet and found like 20 or 30 things that you could actually put onto something like the real real. So it seems to me like there's not only the sustainability, but there's huge supply that if you didn't have something like the real real, it, there'd be no market for it. It would just sort of hang in somebody's closet. They'd go through their closet and maybe donate it somewhere or throw it out. It just seems like there's a lot of runway in terms of what people have and then what you can tap into. And you must feel like you're only tapping the very surface of oh the opportunity gosh. right now. Are you ready for this? So I'm going to give you a U.S. number and a worldwide number. Yeah. In the U.S., there is $60 billion worth of personal luxury products consumed every year. $60 billion. billion. Worldwide, it's $200 Billion. So when I say personal luxury, I'm yeah. talk, I'm not talking cars or wine or hospitality. I'm talking personal fashion, fine jewelry, uh, watches. Okay, that's it. Men's and women's, yeah. 60 billion. Oh, and some high-end cosmetics, right. still a small portion. So then you think, what happens? In three years, two to three years, maybe you're over it. So you buy more. But this is a reoccurring. And the yeah. personal uh, luxury market after 2008 really dipped. But now it's growing about 5 to 7% a year. Mm -hmm. So you've got that growing, growing, growing. And so you've got this supply, even discounted for what we're talking about, in the trillions of dollars worldwide. Yeah. So when I think about what we're doing, when we just did an awareness study. Only 2% of all potential consigners in the U.S. are working with us. Yeah. So I we we, we have a long yeah. we have a long way to a go. A long run way to go. Yeah. And it's a really fun, interesting business too, because um it's incredibly personal. It's a it's a weird thing that way. But when you do I when I get something, I shop all the time from the real world. I don't like to think about somebody owning it until maybe I know who owned it. And then right. I really feel like it's a very personal thing, but we don't disclose people's names unless it's a celebrity sale and they want it disclosed. Oh, really? Yes. And then do you get much more if it's oh, a celebrity? It's, yes. I yeah. mean, we do and it moves faster. It yeah, can be gone in favorite. 20 minutes and yes. <laughs> yeah. And once in a while, um, cause it's all hidden in the warehouse, but once in a while someone's checking in, they'll go, this is so-and-so thing. I'm like, it is, you know, yeah. you have that natural cool. curiosity. Yeah. It That's is cool. really cool. So if I, um, go back, um, to some of the experiences that you had, the, the name of this show is never stand still because, um, it's, I do martial arts all the time. And basically my instructor always says, like, if you stand still, you're going to get hit. And, what I found in all of my interviews, every single one of them is, and we all have this in common, is we've all gotten hit. Um, and we've all had to recover from being hit at some time. And how you recover from that, the process that you go through, I think to me, when I'm actually looking to hire people, I'm not looking anymore for the perfect individual who's only had successes because I just don't think that that's real in life. I'm looking for somebody who's faced some sort of advers uh, adversary conditions and has worked their way through that. As you look at some of the experiences you had, and you and I talked about some of this beforehand, I mean, I, like some people get punched, but you had like a one-two punch com combination um, in both your personal life and your professional life when you were running pets.com. How how long did it take you to work your way through it? How did you start to think about the next chapter? Because I think everybody who watches the program wonders, like, like, how would I react in that situation? And how did you? And then to see the success that you're having right now, which is really unbelievable. I think people want to figure out how do I em emulate that? So, I mean, just to be clear that I shut down pets um, 
it was in no, early November of 1999, and it was the same day my husband asked me for a divorce, and he knew I was going to shut the company down because right. it was we were public, so the SEC was involved, mm-hmm. and I was shutting it down to give money back to shareholders. So it was a bad day, and <laughs> yeah. um, it was a really bad day. <laughs> um, and then I would say um, I didn't recover quickly, uh-huh. and I didn't— um, and I really had to take a look at that. Um, if you think of like Homer's Homer's Odyssey, I mean, we yeah. were talking a little bit about yeah. Grace before, yeah. Yeah. and you think like he went on this ten-year sojourn. I would say that my recovery was too slow, and I. But having said that, I'm not sure I could have accelerated it. Yeah. And what? I mean, I did a lot. I mean, it wasn't like I wasn't busy. I went to. Bali. I took some art classes. I started working again. I was consulting. Yeah. But in terms of really feeling like I I'm, was so excited about everything and you know thrilled to get to work and, and full of great ideas and really learning again, that took I would for me I would say it took almost ten years. Wow. And um, which doesn't mean I wasn't doing things sure, and course. moving forward, yeah. but to really feel whole again. And when I look back, part of it's because. Um, and I think this is unfortunately more a female thing than a man mm-hmm. thing. I was beating myself up too long. Um, I got a lot of negative press. Um, I still have a long memory on some of the people that wrote about it and, you know, calling me the dumbest person in the valley. So I had that going for me when I'd meet people anyway. Um, and, um, you know, those, the, in fact, the interesting thing, the people that wrote the most negative press fell fast and have never gotten up. So maybe they'll get up or maybe they're, you know, still yeah. those people. Uh, um, but bad press, uh, bad divorce. Also, I was 42 yeah. when um, when that happened, which is sort of the time where you go, whoa, as a woman, I didn't have kids. Is that okay? I know it sounds crazy to look at it that way. It wasn't. I wasn't that maternal to begin with, but I had to do a gut check. Yeah. So I had that. Um, and then I had to figure out, well, do I move and start over? Do I embrace? Where do I go? So I would say I could have possibly— gotten out of it faster if I would have taken a lesson from some of the men around me that also failed during that time and they failed bigger than I did. You never heard their name in the press, so they didn't have the negative press. But more importantly, they just got on with things. And I do think women internalize too much. What could I have done differently? Was it timing? Was it this? And then I had other stuff going on. Um, And I would say once I sort of figured out, wait, this is my life. I'm going to start directing it. I'm going to have fun. I'm, I, you know, I know who I am. It doesn't matter what people mm-hmm. think I am. Everything changed. It just, it was a journey. It was like, I, I call it my own odyssey. It was my own odyssey. Yeah. So I had to, you know, slay some Gorgons there. Right. Um, but it was good. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm glad I did that because I, uh, I'm really sort of fearless now. Yeah. And I don't know if I would have come to that place if I would have recovered that quickly. I didn't yeah. have that in me to just pop right up and go, yeah, I'm good now. Yeah. Well, I think um, a lot of the confidence that I have, maybe some same thing for you, the confidence you have, comes from having seen so much, right? And having gotten knocked down and knowing that, you know what, in the cool light of the new dawn, you know, things look different and you can move forward. Like I would call you the strongest person in the valley, you know, because you, you know, are so inspiring in terms of your story and like what you went through and where you are right now. I mean, you might beat yourself up on some of that stuff, but to me, it's so inspirational. And my bet is to everybody watching, it's the same inspirational story. It's like not many people go through that. Like when I talk to most people and they talk about like their getting punched, it's it's actually not a, that big a thing, you know? <laughs> and you really absorbed two things and then came back to create, um, you know, just to find yourself to create something and to move forward. And so I I don't know, to me it is, that's why I was looking so forward to our, to our conversation. So maybe let me- um, By the way, thank you. Oh. That's really nice of you to say that. I mean, I don't feel that, I mean, I just feel like, you know, I'm doing what I do, but I appreciate you saying that. But if you look at it, actually, objectively, it's an amazing story. Um, 
Is there any, maybe one or two things that you could tell um, our viewers about, um, if you like, like we summarized, like what leadership lessons you had, but maybe lessons in terms of just life in general with, when you're faced with these kinds of things, how you like started to work your way through it. Like what are the things that you thought about and then did that actually made a difference in how you felt? Well, all right. So I think the biggest thing is I started focusing on what I really loved. And that, yeah. you know, when you're um, when you're a hired gun CEO, you're not always saying, oh, I love this. I can't yeah. wait to jump in. You're like, yeah, I can do this. It's an interesting problem. Sure. But that doesn't mean you love it. Right. And um, my first CEO gig was because the company was failing. They're like, oh, can you? That's and I when had you a were plan. 30? Yeah, I, yeah, right. So, and they like, do you have a plan to turn around? I go, oh, yeah, I, I have a plan. They're like, okay, you do yeah. it. <laughs> and I'm yeah. like, okay. Yeah. They're like, now you're CEO. But that wasn't like a big win. I had a plan. It worked. It ended up being a success. But, you know, it's like getting back to your core. What do you love? What do you feel good about? Why do you, you know, we're taking the temperature. What do you really want to do? You know, because you never know how long you're going to have in life. But yeah. if you could, like, spend your days, what would you get excited about every single day? And, you know, luckily, um, and this gets back to my childhood, I had a father who loved what he did every day. So I grew up in a household where um, it was really, really exciting for him to go to work. And he he's an artist. He was mm. a commercial artist. Every day he was creating. My mother also was an artist. She dropped out of college to get married. Unfortunately, she was sick almost my entire life, which is a horrible thing to go through as a kid. But when you go through it as a kid um, and then you become an adult, you do have tenacity and grit because you had to, like, pull yeah. up and do things yeah. that um, – and I was the oldest of four. So you, it does create a character. And I'd say when I fell, it sort of like got back – I had to get back to my basics – and, I mean, you know, I read a lot. I traveled a lot. Um, I grew up in artist households, so I always was drawing and painting, so doing that. And then the other thing is um, I love – I've always loved sports. I love sports. Yeah, me too. And uh, to me it's such – it's – the competition's great. The fact that when you walk away, someone's lost, someone won. Hardly, right. it doesn't really happen in the other place. Right. You know, like, yay, they won. You can get behind uh, the values. I think the team values are, I like mm -hmm. team sports. I like yep. the team values. I think that's awesome. So I really got involved, watch, um, got involved in watching sports and reading sports books because for some reason that fed into my psyche in a way I could understand. Um and baseball in particular, I've even talked about this. When you look at someone feeling great about their batting average and you look at what realistically they miss 65% of all, I'm like, oh, my God, that's it's awesome. It's amazing, isn't it? It's, it's great. amazing. And yet they're Just like – keep swinging. They keep swinging. Yeah. And there's always another game. Yeah. And I almost had to talk myself into that. So um, – but – but it also was love of art, love of sports, love of travel, and just, like, wanting to get going again. And I've always had a really high energy level. So when you think of you've got all of that, you've got to put it to – it can either be constructive or, destru or destructive. And yep. so I really yep. was always more a constructive person, so I wanted to put it to good use. Yeah. Oh, and I did a lot of nonprofit boards during that time too, which was, you know, good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's meaningful. It's, it, it was It good. also – allows you to connect back to what's important, like you were saying. Yeah. So, Julie, I, just again, I want to thank you. I can't wait to watch all of your success going forward uh, and uh, keep reading about uh, that. Your lips. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. We'll knock okay. on wood on that. And um, uh, let's stay in touch. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for Thanks. being here. Yeah, Thanks. Appreciate it.